Bless you. You may be seated. My subject tonight is anointed and appointed for action number two. <laughs> A second time around on this message. We're talking about our miracle contact with Jesus for our miracle impact on people. Anointed and appointed for action. Basing this on Acts 1 and 2, he, through the Holy Ghost, gave commandment to the apostles whom he had chosen. I want to read some verses to you as a background for this message tonight. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus said, Follow me and I'll make you fishers of people. How many want to do that? Say, that's what I want. They straightway left their nets and followed him. <clears throat> a little bit later, he found some more fellows, and verse 22 says immediately, they left the ship and their father, and they followed him. Where did they follow him? What were they doing? Just preaching? Just lecturing? The next verse says, he went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Is that all? Is that all? And healing. I love it. All manner of sickness. And all manner of disease. Among the people. Verse 24 says. And they, his fame spread abroad. And they brought to him. All sick people. That were taken with divers diseases and torments. And those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic, and those which had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people. Don't miss that. There followed him great multitudes of people. And seeing the multitudes, he said, I got to teach them some more. And he taught them more. And he started off by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now that's nice. We get a, a more practical picture of that in Luke. But before I leave Matthew, I want to point out to you, I don't, you know, there's a lot, if, if you study the origin of the Gospels, uh, there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of information handed us that's rather surprising to us people in this generation to find out that, uh, you ever wonder why, the, why, why it's, uh, why it's uh, sectioned out like it is, and they tell us that it was uh, categorized by subjects and mixed and re-put together. And uh, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of information about how this came together for us. But uh, let me go ahead with Matthew's sequence of events. Whether it's the right sequence, I don't think anybody knows. And this, which explains why the sequences of events are very different in the different Gospels. But uh, Jesus goes ahead and teaches. Remember how he started. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He starts off with that. Now, then he goes ahead and teaches all of this stuff in Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. And you come to the end of Matthew 7, and the last verse, or the next to the last verse says, in fact, he finishes up with his teaching about, now if you hear all this, verse 24, and do it, 
You'll be likened to a wise person who built your house on a rock. Rains ascended, the floods came, the wind blew, beat upon the house. It fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. The rock of hearing the word of God and doing it. Young people, when you hear it, do it. Let our creed become our deed. We haven't learned until we do. You can't cram truth. Truth is like food. You can't eat a meal and turn around and eat another one. We have a phobia today almost of cramming. We call it feeding our spirit man, and the women don't even have one, and they do it too. <clears throat> and they go everywhere, and they're taught, come to the convention, because you must feed your spirit man. And they go day after day after day and feed their spirit man. I haven't heard of anybody feeding their spirit woman, but anyway, I hope some of the women do in the process. But if I was a woman, I'd want to feed my woman. I wouldn't feed my man. You know, but that's okay. If they want to feed their man, they can feed their man. Uh, they get around it by saying it's the spirit man Jesus in me. That's nice. That's palatable. I'll buy that. <clears throat> Gets away so we can keep on saying man and mean woman. I'd rather go ahead and say woman if I mean woman. <clears throat> but, but you can't, you can't cram and cram and cram. You might choke yourself to death. You might die of indigestion. You might make yourself sick, ill, kill yourself if you do nothing but eat and cram. Well, you can't do it. In a little while, you can't do it. And that's, that's what explains what's happened to a lot of people who spend their life trying to feed their spirit man. And they're never satisfied and the more they get, the more they want, and they practice none of it. Except they're good people. I don't mean say they're not good people. We're good people. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't cheat. We're honest. We love God. We pray. We fast. We stay before God. We serve Him. We intercede. We stay in our closets. Good, but good for nothing. All those things that get nothing, that go nowhere, that don't, don't reach people, the kind of goodness that's good for ourselves. And we shine pretty, and we sound pretty, and we pucker pretty, and we pray pretty, and prophesy pretty, and interpret pretty, but we're good for nothing. By good for something, I mean share what you got with somebody who doesn't have it. That's all. If I was you, I'd clap bigger on that. That's what I call being good for something. And I have the feeling that's the paramount ideal in Scripture and in God's mind that we get it and we give it. We receive it and we share it. We hear it and we communicate it. And if it isn't that, it's, it's a dead hole. It's a dead sea. It's hopelessness. And you'll go to seed on it and become a cynic with it. And they are there all over the country. Cynical behind the curtain. Pious when the television lights go on. Because we're trying to cram it and get holier and and be more spiritual. And God don't need holy or spiritual either. He's got all that. He can, he, he's got lots of that. We can't beat him at being holy and spiritual. He is holy. He is spiritual. He needs us in the flesh reaching people who hurt, touching them, healing them, lifting them, blessing them. That's what we are appointed for, and that's what we are anointed for. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So he finishes this long discourse 
of wonderful teachings with this idea, if you hear my words and do them now, you'll, be, you'll have a strong house and it won't fall in the storm. That's his idea. Now you've heard me. Now let's do something with it. And it came to pass, when he ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Evidently, they didn't sound very convincing. Then, chapter 8. Now, I don't know if this fits, or whether they divided it, chopped it up, and put it together this way. But in this case, it makes a good argument, a good point. When he was come down from the mountain, he'd finished all that wonderful teaching and told him, now, if you hear this, don't just stack it and live off of it and follow me to the next convention and feed your spirit man again. No, that's not the idea. If you hear my sayings and do them, go out and put them in everyday practice, you're going to be blessed. So then he finishes his statement and he comes down from the mountain and behold, a great multitude followed him. And behold, there was a leper. There came a leper worshiping him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Jesus put forth his hand and touched him. He was a teacher, and he was a toucher. I want to be a toucher as much as I want to be a teacher. I want to be a healer as much as I'm a spieler. If I'm gifted, I want to use my gift to lift somebody. Do you? That's practical to me. And then the story goes on. And any of you who've studied the 8th chapter of Matthew knows that it goes from one miracle to another. From one needy person to another. And he keeps on meeting those needs. Meaning that he was one who went out and touched people and helped people after he taught people. That's the idea that we want to get across at International Gospel Center. We are anointed and we are appointed for action. Not to sit in our corner and be holy and be pious and be spiritual and be known as someone super. That's not what the world needs. The world needs practical people with practical knowledge of Jesus Christ and faith enough to communicate it. Believe in it enough to believe it will work on people. I keep preaching here what we've got will heal anybody if we'll just get it in touch with people, in contact with people. You believe that? We can heal any home. We can save any divorce problem. We can solve any young person's problem. We can solve any business problem. We can solve any discouragement. We can solve what makes people commit suicide or quit in life, lay down and die before their time. You and I have the anointing and have the appointment to do that, that is ministry. Ministry is not what I'm doing in the church pulpit when the lights are on and it looks pretty and we're all dressed up. Ministry is out in the, in the barrios, out in the villages, out in the streets, out in the alleys, out where people hurt, out in the hospitals, out in the jails, out in the communes, out where the people are struggling and living and dying and killing themselves and destroying themselves. They need a healer. And we're the healer with the healing touch. But we have to go there and touch them. And that's what we're anointed and appointed to do. Are you hearing me? Now, it goes on. A centurion, 
My servant is at home sick, grievously tormented. I'll come and heal him. Oh, I'm not worthy. Just say the word. I'm in authority. I give orders. My soldiers obey. You give orders. I know those sicknesses will obey you. Jesus said, that's great faith. I haven't found that kind of faith even among my own people in Israel. That's great. Go home, everything's okay. Hallelujah. Helping people. You would be surprised what would happen through your ministry and through your words if you would pronounce them. If you don't pronounce them, there's no force. I wish I could get every one of you to hear and understand what uh, Brother Mbanda of Zaire told me. He's a Bantu tribesman. He's next to President Mobutu in Zaire. And he's a Holy Ghost-filled Christian while he was ambassador to Israel from Zaire. And that's when he began receiving all of our books and all of our tapes. And he used them and had meetings in the embassy in, in Jerusalem every week. And there he prayed for the sick and he talked to the people and played our tapes and read the books. Isn't that wonderful? It was through him that President Mobutu invited us there for those two weeks. But this man told me, he says, Brother Osborne, I love your teaching because you believe in the power of the word spoken by a believer. See, he's caught on. He said, Brother Osborne, it'll shock you to know we bond to tribes People believe in the power of words. He said that's why we have the traditions in our, in our native religions and pagan practices of pronouncing curses and blessings. They do like Old Testament prophets did, except Old Testament prophets did it in the name of Jehovah God and worshiped the true and living God where these dear people are simply practicing religions that have come down through the centuries as echoes of the true way to God and they've lost the contact with the true and living God and in all the muddled voices and opinions that have been handed down have created pagan gods unto themselves and pray to them and believe in them. But many of the ideas that they have, like their blood sacrifices and many of their oblations, are patterned after Old Testament Hebrew patterns of worship. But they've lost the semblance and lost, the, the, lost track of the true and living God. That's why we love to go give them the gospel. They're such beautiful people. But what I was going to tell you, he told us, he said, we Bantus believe in the power of words. He said, for example, Brother Osborne, if someone, if, now this, is, this isn't now, he's a Christian, but I mean, he's telling me how they would do in their tribal religions, their tribal beliefs. He said, for example, if someone had done me harm and I was angry with them, he said, I would set aside a certain night and I would bring a certain sacrifice and I would kill a certain sacrifice in the night and I would have my helpers and I would have my witch doctor and we would ha they would have their drums and we would play music and we would offer my sacrifice and we would dance and we would say, we would chant and then, at the proper moment, and we know when that is, I would step out, and I would stand up erect, and I would pronounce, may a curse come upon this man, and I, I would say what I want to happen. And I would pronounce it. And after I pronounced it, he says, Brother Osborne, we all knew I had released the energy of God in my words. That's what he put it. The energy, because they believe they're worshiping the true God too. Many of them, they don't know what he is, but the big God, lots of other, he's got lots of other gods, but they worship the big God. 
We have no question that what words I release, the power of God goes through me and in those words, and those words have the power to carry out their curse. And he said, they always come to pass. He was very, very certain about that. And I looked at him and I said, where has the church been? Sitting around talking about word power and flapping, clapping their lips, as they say in Africa, making noise and believing nothing. He said, suppose I do that and my friend knows I have done that. If he hears about it, and if he repents, he will come quick to me and beg my forgiveness. And I can forgive him, but my words will still be out there and they will be carrying their power to bring the curse upon my friend. So I must have another ceremony. And I must bring the witch doctor and I must make another sacrifice and at the proper time, I will step forth and I will say, I call back the words that I pronounced against my brother. May they lose their power and have no more power to bring about curse. I annul them now. And he said, then it's okay. Now, you can call that superstition. You can call that paganism. My point to you is saying God's words are powerful. God created the world with words. He gave us the power to use words. We're the only creatures he ever created with the power of words. Words are seeds. Seeds are energy. Seeds energize of their kind. Healing seeds from God's word will produce healing in people. Blessing seeds from God's word planted in them will produce blessings. Love seeds from God's word transmitted by us into people by them hearing us will create the fruit of love in anybody, even an opponent who makes the mistake of listening. You can change him. He'll be changed. Maybe not right then, but the seed goes in him and brings to pass the miracle. What do you think happened the other night to Brother Frankel, that Jew from New York, to whom that Puerto Rican witnessed time and time again, Bring in a track, bring in a track, bring in a track. He does read the track. He was making the mistake of listening, of looking. And the words were going in him planted and were energizing the life of God in him. And he got him to go to church and ask him to say something. And he opened his mouth and said, I accept the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. <laughs> that Orthodox Jew was changed like that. Hallelujah. What a miracle. The power of words. The police chief there in Nakuru that, was, that had injured a leg and couldn't walk on it but was in his Jeep and was angry at us and didn't want the crusade to go on. Sit out in his Jeep and listen. But that's where he made his mistake. He came to look but instead he listened. And the word recreated him. And the police chief, instead of shutting us down, his leg got cured and the chief got saved and is today a preacher of the gospel in, in Kenya. Hallelujah. The power of the word of God. And oh boy, I could tell hundreds of stories like that all over the world. The word energizes. I started to say, you would be amazed at the power that there is in you to bless people with the word of God if you would speak the word of God to people. 
I'm talking about Jesus saying to the centurion, Go home. Your son lives. And it worked. Jesus believed in the power of his words. He was appointed. He was anointed. He believed in both of them. He spoke the word and the servant was healed. Hallelujah. You would be amazed at what would happen if you would practice the presence of Jesus. Talk to people. Minister to people. Being conscious of of Jesus in you, of his word in you, of his seed in you, and speak his word with faith. You would be amazed at the coals that would dry up, at the tumors that would disappear, at the, at the backs that are lame that would go, that would be straight, at the pains in the body that would go away. You would be amazed at the hope you would light in the heart's of people in despair. But because of something you said, they'll tell you six weeks down the way, when you said that, I saw a light, or I heard a voice, or something transformed, something took place in me, and that moment, it was all fixed, and I knew it was okay. But if you stay dumb, and don't let God put his creative power through your lips. You will never know the joy of ministering the word of life to hurting people. Are you hearing me? He carried on. He went by Peter's house. His wife's mother was sick of a fever. Isn't it beautiful? He touched her. You'll be amazed at the fevers and sicknesses that will die if you will touch them in that name that's above every name and believe in that name. But if you don't touch them, they won't get healed and you will never know the joy of ministry. You all saw that lady here. What was her name that used to help Daisy? Uh, with the Bible school studies? Sandra. McDowell. You all, you, many of you weren't here, but uh, in, the, in some of the early meetings, as we were preaching on healing, she became convinced for the first time she could do it. Hallelujah. And there was someone deaf. I, I believe they were deaf in one ear, weren't they? sitting next to her, behind her. And during the other prayers, she ventured. Isn't that beautiful? To her, it was a venture. It shouldn't be a venture. It should be an everyday practice. Oh, you say, Osborne, come off of it. I'm not that holy. I'm just starting on this sermon. Next one coming up, I'm going to convince you you're that holy. I'm not going to quit on you. God wants to use people. She ventured. Then she did it like the Bible said to do it. And we had encouraged her, to, not her personally, everybody, to do it. And she did. And she rebuked the deaf spirit. And it left. And her eyes were bright. Sandra, come to life. Oh, I can do it. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that precious? You'll be amazed at what God will do through you. You are anointed. You are appointed for action. Not to be holy and pious. Come and collect another sermon. Eat that too. Get holier. Who cares about your holiness? The prostitute couldn't care less how holy you are. The drunkard, he don't care if you got 40 gifts. The homosexual, what does he care about your interpretations in tongues? He says, I hurt. Can you help me? I need help. I need God. I'm scared. I want help. That's what they're interested in. And then it got bigger. And when the even was come after Peter's house, even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. He cast out the spirits with his word. See, you'll never know the joy of making a devil leave the house for you if you don't cast him out. If you're silent, if you say, oh, I can't do that. Oh, that's not my ministry. 
You'll never have the joy of doing that. You are a creature of God, created in his image where you can communicate truth in words. You can communicate energy in words. Word power, seed, seed power. You have it. You're made like God. You can do it. You'll never know the fun of it if you don't do it. Say, I'll do it. Say, I'm doing it. Hallelujah. A lot of you, I know you are doing it. A lot of you, you've wanted to. And I'm not, I'm not making this as a reprimand of you. I'm saying this to entice you. Go for it, baby. Nobody worried but the devil. <laughs> Nobody got a problem but the devil. You head his way, he'll back up. As soon as you make up your mind who you are. That God's word is good and your lips as good as, any, as, as it was in the lips of anybody in the Bible. Bible days are here today. Hallelujah. Same Bible, same God, same Christ, same Holy Ghost. You believe that? Amen. He cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Now, I told you a while ago, this is a little, uh, uh, another view of this over in Luke. And so I wanted to right quick bring this to you. Now this Luke, this is, this is a beautiful thing. He's just been, uh, he's just been in, the, in the synagogue and, uh, and uh, he's told this, this dear man with a right hand that was withered to stand up in the midst of everybody. God likes to do things where they can be seen. He got him up where it could be public and uh, healed him. Told him to stretch forth his hand, he did right there. And uh, th some of them were filled with madness, it says. <laughs> Isn't that a shame? Commune one with another what they might do with Jesus. This Luke chapter 6, verse 11. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his 12 disciples. Now listen to this. I'm talking about you're appointed, you're anointed. Called his 12 disciples. No, I'm sorry. He called his disciples, lots of them, lots of them. And of them, he chose 12 whom he named apostles. Now, the theologians make a big deal over that, but all in the world that means is, I've had a whole crowd of you disciples follow me. Twelve of you have been with me longer. Than you that start out with me first, you've heard the most, I've taught you the most. Now, I'm, I, now it's time for you to start doing something with this. So he said, I'm going to call you apostles, meaning I'm going to send you. The rest of you keep following me. You need to learn some more, hear some more, get this in you a little bit more. We all need that. You know, a lot of people run out too quick. Get it in you. But my land, you can't choke on it forever. You come sometime where you can get it. I mean, we're not talking about years and years and years. We're talking about a little while. I mean, Jesus' whole ministry was just, just three years. And I know some folks, well, okay. But anyway... <laughs> And he chose them to 12 of them whom he said, I'll call you apostles also. Meaning now, you, you've caught on to enough. It's time for you to be one of my sent ones. I'm going to send you out to do it. And it names them. Verse 17. And he came down with them and stood in the plain. And the company of his disciples, see a big company of them, and a great multitude of people. Isn't that wonderful? You want people around you? you hey, you'll never be lonely if you'll communicate Jesus. You'll never be alone. There are Christians, good people, that spend their time whining because nobody loves them. Nobody comes to fellowship with them. I like the old lady that Robert Schuller talked about up there in Oregon when they went up there to visit her. And she, uh, her daughter, and, and I think, Donna, you talked about that, and, and she had passed away. But her daughter was curious and looked at her day book, her appointment book, because she was a sweet woman, a lover of people, and had always practiced befriending people. And when she was bedridden, the last two, three years she was bedridden, and the daughter read the last year of her life in bed, she had had 
over 350 appointments of people coming to her to get blessed. You never die lonely. You never live lonely if you communicate Jesus. If you believe in what's in you, it'll help people. That's why I say, put me on a creek bank. Run me out of every place, every city. Put me on a creek bank. Put Daisy and I there. We love Jesus. And pretty soon someone will come along and wonder who we are. We'll figure a way to talk to them. And we'll communicate to them. They got a problem, we'll solve it. They got a sickness, we'll tell them about our Lord and he'll heal it. And they'll run off smiling and tell somebody else and they'll come. And pretty soon they'll build a city around us. You bet. Because when you've got something good, the whole world wants to taste it and enjoy it. And the greatest fun in the world is to communicate this good life that we have with people. What we got will do anything, but we got to touch people to make it work. And so here it happened again. A great multitude of people. They came out of Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of his diseases. He's not just a lecturer. He's a, a toucher, a contactor, a lifter of people. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him, and he healed them all. Glory to God. You'll be surprised how you can heal them all if you'll just do it. You want to try it? You want to take Jesus at his word and say, Lord, show me somebody needy. That's why we're talking about the believers network. That's why we're encouraging believers at International Gospel Center. Stop and think about your own house. The rent is being paid. The payments are being made. The utilities have got to be paid anyway. That's your domain. That belongs to you. That's real estate where you're the boss. Glory to God. Start the habit that the early Christians did of telling a friend or two or three or ten or twelve to come over and let's chat for a while and tell them and befriend them and tell them about Jesus. And we can double and triple International Gospel Center just by falling in love with somebody in our neighborhood. Just by developing an interest in hurting people and reaching out to them and putting what we believe to the test. Hallelujah. And believing in it. And watch it work. Boy, I know what it is when you've sown the seed. I'm a great gardener. You go up on a farm, boy, you've got to know how to a gardener. You'll starve to death. And to get the soil all fine and beautiful with a fine rake, hoe, and get it ready. And sow the seeds or, or plant the little ones and get them all in there pretty and just sit back and grin and watch it produce. That's all we are. We're seed planters. We're farmers. We're co-laborers with God. And people are our garden. Hallelujah. And we can put the word in them with a deed, with a word, with a kindness, with a visit. And it's so nice to get them over to your house and then just start, just start being regular friends. Take one night a week, dedicate one night a week so they know what night it's going to be. And you'll be surprised at the hurting people if they find out you won't you, that you don't argue and fuss. First, they'll be scared. Or they'd be afraid if you tell them he's going to talk religion or something like that. I don't believe in religion, but I mean salvation. That'd probably scare them worse. But, uh, you know, they'd be scared of that. But, uh, and especially if you get them in there and you start, you start browbeating them and start judging them and start condemning them and start picking on them and start investigating them and start trying to play a, the glorified psychologist on them, all that stuff, you won't do anything but be ended up, end up with nobody to visit with. But if you will be a representative of Jesus and witness for him and talk the good life and talk the good news and share the good stuff, 
and pray the good prayers and believe for the good things, you'll find a good ministry flowing through you to people and it'll make good people all around you. Hallelujah. And they'll follow you over here and then they'll be coming up here at the front to accept Christ and being wonderfully saved and changed. If it uh, doesn't already happen, it probably already happened in your home, but they'll come here and make it public, and it'd be the most glorious life you ever got into in your life. That's going to happen. That's prophetic. You believe it? Say, that's going to happen. Hallelujah. You believe it? I believe it with all my heart. And what I love about this, here's what he said. All this crowd came out. Now look, I'm still talking about I'm st I've still got these, this bunch of disciples and these 12 apostles. Sounds so holy. But just these 12 that's been around him a long time. He said, now I want you, everything you see me do, you go do it. You go do it. All this apostleship, this holy stuff, you get behind a holy pulpit and put on a holy garb and you're really somebody to crack the whip and be the authority over. That's, that's, that, that's really screwed up some way. Let's keep it simple. All he's saying is, some of you have been around me long enough, you can do it now. Start doing it. Go share it. Go to people. Help them. Hallelujah. Then come back and run with me some more and see some more and go do it some more. You'll be apostles. I'll send you. You go out and do some more. The rest of you guys hang around a little longer and I'll make you apostles in a little while. How you doing? And they came and wonderful things happened. And he taught them. And a multitude came. And they came to be healed of their diseases. And the Bible says there went virtue out of it. Could virtue go out of you? Are you holy enough for that? Folks talk about all this holy stuff. And they get holy and holy and holy. Spiritual, spiritual, spiritual. And never figure virtue can go out of them. If we got all that in us, it ought to be good for something. Let's get it on somebody with a cancer. See what it'll do. And if it don't work, let's go get some more. And then go back and touch again. See if it works. Of course, the better thing is to believe it'll work. But even if you just check out and see if it'll work, I think God will give you a surprise now and then just to be good to you. Just to encourage you, he's pretty nice. I would if I was a parent and children and they're trying to prove something, wouldn't you? God's pretty much like us. He made us, you know. We're supposed to be in his image. I think he thinks like we do. That's a shock to some holy folks. He's got good sense. I'm smart. He's a lot smarter than me. He made me. Hallelujah. You believe that? Do you believe that about God? Do you believe that, that you can help people? And, and here's what I want to bring you to. Virtue went out of him. He healed them all. And then look at the next verse. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, you put those two together, and you have an interesting case. Let's go back and look at that other one. And then I'm, I'm quitting. Uh, he starts out in, in Matthew 5, seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain and sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, over here, it gets told quite a bit different. He's with a multitude of people, He's been down from the mountain instead of going up the mountain. Now, you, you study all this and, and you find out what they've done when they, put, when they put the canons of the scriptures together. And you don't get upset about it. It's all truth. It's just that a lot of fancy people have worked on it down through the years. So you've got to look for the essence of, of the thing. Now, here... And see, some of them didn't catch all the words. Some of them didn't translate it. Oh, there was a lot, there's a lot of things in translation uh, from, from uh, you know, it's possible that most of this was said in Hebrew. In fact, quite probable that Jesus taught it in Hebrew. And then it was translated over here into Greek. And then from Greek, all these other languages down through to English. It's a wonder that we got what we got left. So don't discredit the word of God. We don't mean to do that. We mean we search for the spirit of of the meaning of the word. And here we have, he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, now over here he's talking to his disciples, but he, come, but he goes up on a mountain and sits down and talks to them. Here he lifts up his eyes to, on his disciples and says, uh, over here he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs are the kingdom. Over here he says, blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. 
Now over here it sounds like that he's blessing them for being poor. But over here in the other place it says poor in spirit. Luke didn't include the in spirit part. But blessed. So, so we put it together and he's looking at his disciples that's following him. And he says now I'm, I'm going to teach you some more. But when I look at you. You with me? You with me? You listening? When I look at you. You're terrific. You're, you're going to follow my example. You're going to do wonderful things. Wow. I don't know whether he said wow or not. Might have. Good word if he'd known it. Wow. To them to say, I think he says wow when he looks at us. Especially me. I know he does. If you don't think he says wow about you, he probably don't. You're with me? But he looks at him and he says, Wow, you're, you're, you're blessed. Oh, blessed are you, poor in spirit. Blessed are you. Yours is the kingdom of God. Everything that my father and me represent is in you. I'm sharing it with you. You can do anything. If you believe on me, why well, he said if you believe on me, you can ask anything in my name and I'll do it. And the works that I've done, you can do them. Try it. You like it. Just use my name. You can do anything I do. Wow. You're terrific. Blessed are you. Humble. Real. You know that the spirit, the anointing, the power, that's where the power is. You're blessed. Yours is the kingdom of The next time I preach to you, I'm going to take up right about there. And we're going to go from there. And I want to show you your anointing and how you're appointed. God has committed to you and me the gospel. Did you know that? It has been committed to our trust. We are sent forth to bear his name and to declare his news to everybody. And he says, go in my name. Lo, I am with you always. And in Hebrews, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. It's simple, folks. Religion has complicated it. God wants us to get a fresh grasp of the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ and practice the presence of Jesus in Tulsa. Tulsa is hurting. They need help. The needy are everywhere. And they're soured. They're soured. And you know there's probably, I said to someone the other day, they were talking about ministering. Uh, let's see, is you right there, yeah. And she was talking about ministering and how she's already started inviting people into her home. And I told her one of these, I want you to testify one of these nights. When I'm preaching along this line, I'm going to have you testify uh, and tell the people what's happening at your house. Just because she has caught on to the idea. And she, said, she was telling about the, the people that come in there that are hurting and that are soured and have been offended in... in, in in some of their Christian experiences. And I, I said to her, I said, you know, my dear, in Tulsa, there may be more bruised Christians than sinners. But we're the healers. You know why they're bruised? Is because of a lot of holy stuff in the pulpit that never matched up in daily life. And they got sick of it and backed off and quit and figured the whole thing was like that. It's not. We can give Tulsa an option. We can resurrect the hopes of thousands of Christians in Tulsa who have quit 
and gone home and turned on their TV and said, let the world go to hell. We can change them and bring them back to life, a form of resurrection, isn't it? We can do it. If we don't argue or judge or condemn or put down or play holy and pious, but if we be human persons, God in the flesh, hallelujah, with all of its mistakes, but walk with God the best we can and share our Jesus with people and touch them and heal them and bless them. That's the most spiritual experience you can ever have in this world. Everybody's trying to get a spiritual experience. That's it, baby. When you bring life back to someone that's dead, when you lift a fallen brother or sister and, and give them new hope, when you find someone that's lost and in despair and lonely and share the friendship of Jesus and light the flicker of hope again where they can look out their window and see maybe there's something to live for. You've changed a life. You've changed a family. You've changed, you've changed hope in a life. And you've given them purpose again. That's the holiest thing we can do as Christians is to lift people to a place of dignity, self-esteem, walking with God, finding that they have purpose. People who kill themselves have given up on life and don't believe they're good for anything or that they can do anything or that they have any purpose other than another digit in another computer. And we can show them the way. And Tulsa is crammed with those kind that have been hurt and put down and scared and frightened and have become cynical and have quit. And we are the Savior. Hallelujah. We are the salt. We are the light. We are the life. We can do it when we believe we can do it. And boy, I want to believe in my words as much as Brother Mbanda, the Bantu in Africa, believed in his words with a bunch of drums beaten. I believe in my words because my words are based on his words. And when his words flow through me, there's power, there's energy, and the devil's in trouble. And I put that word out there. And Isaiah said, it will accomplish that for which it's sent. It'll never return void. You bet. Hallelujah. 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 Stand to your feet. In the name of Jesus, I bless you that have watched my video. I pray that this message has lifted you and given you hope, not only for yourself, but that you will share it with a neighbor, with a friend, with people all around you and discover the power of Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost flowing through you that will heal people and lift people and bless people. You are called of God. Discover your calling. Accept your calling. Cooperate with your calling. Be God's instrument and ambassador. And whatever you need, he promises to supply. He wants you well and happy. Your problem solved. He wants you to prosper. And then he wants to walk with you in this new life, you that are blessed of the Lord. Hallelujah. Receive that blessing. It's not too good to be true. Accept it now. In the name of Jesus, I pray for you. I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit will visit you now in a quickening experience and give you new life that you didn't know you could have. If you're sick, I pray for your healing, that the power of the Holy Ghost will quicken your body and destroy every sickness in your body. I pray that if you've got a problem that seems unsolvable to you, I pray that by the power of the Holy Ghost, that problem will find a solution, and it will all come as a witness to you that this message is true, and that God has spoken to you in Jesus' name. 